Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome, thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Redefining Image Analysis with NV6.0, IDL 9.0, and the NV Ecosystem. My name is JP Metcalf, and I'm the Solutions Engineering Manager at NV5 Geospatial, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. I'm sure most of you know our company, but just in case, we were L3 Harris, and earlier this year, we were acquired by NV5. We are now NV5 Geospatial Solutions. We are the world's leading provider of geospatial software and services. From data acquisition to analytics to answers, we help organizations solve mission critical challenges. Next slide, Zach. Before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items to go through. We are recording this webinar and we'll email you a link to the recording and the slide deck in the next couple of days. Within your dashboard, you'll see a questions box. All attendees are muted. So if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to enter them into this box and we'll answer them at the end. And lastly, we encourage you to take the survey at the end of the webinar. Your feedback is very important to us. Let's move to the next slide. Joining me today is the wonderful Zach Norman. Zach is one of our product managers at NV5 Geospatial. He's been with the company for the past eight years and is very knowledgeable about our products. He's great at understanding the direction of the market and ensuring our technology meets these needs, such as within the NV ecosystem, which we're going to hear about a little bit more today. He'll go through today's agenda with you in just a bit. All right. Now, for the reason you're here today, I'm going to turn things over to Zach to get us started. Take it away, Zach. Awesome. Thanks, JP, and thanks for the introduction. Um, first off, before I before we start going, I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on the questions as we go. So I, if you have a question about a slide I'm on, pop it in in the questions area, and I will try to keep an eye on it. Uh, JP, you're more than welcome to jump in as we're going if something comes up and, and let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so here's a look at what we've got for our agenda today. So we have a whole bunch of stuff that we want to cover. And at a very high level, this webinar is a little bit different than we've done in the past. Really, our goal with this webinar is to talk about how we have uh, four or five product releases um, that have either already been released or will be here in the next couple of work weeks. Um, and how they come together to solve different problems for organizations and different types of users. So we'll have a little bit of our traditional kind of what's new features and functionality for things like MD and IDL. You know, if you're looking at the, the agenda here, and then we're going to talk about some new stuff that we've got like MD Connect, some really cool things that we've been working on with deep learning and how you can take all this stuff and process it at scale and reuse content that experts create. So just keep in mind that we'll be jumping around between uh, a fair number of products, but we have, I think, a pretty nice story today to kind of tie it all together. Uh, we do have about 45 minutes of content, depending on how fast I talk. So we'll probably be done about 7.45 or 7.50, which will give us some room, room for uh, questions at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and jump on in. So like I said a little bit, this is a kind of a special and unique little release cycle for us. We are releasing a lot of core products, um, which we'll talk about here in just a couple of slides. And not only are we releasing them, but they've got major version changes, meaning this isn't a release where we go from like IDL 8.8 to 8.9. We've got IDL 9.0, MB 6.0, MB Connect 2.0, and MB Deep Learning 3.0. So we have a lot of kind of big and exciting changes that we're going to be talking about today and focusing on the highlights and how all of those come together, as, as I've mentioned. Um, the other part about our little release cycle in this time of year, uh, well, maybe not this time of year, but uh, at least for our products right now, is that like you see in the lower left here, we've got new logos. So one of the other things that's exciting, or at least I think is pretty exciting, is that in about the last um, four to six weeks, you've probably seen a few of these, but we've gotten an update for our IDL and our MV logos. 
And this goes through to any of our MB branded products as well. If you've been checking out our website lately, you've probably seen a little bit of this, but all these icons have made their way into our products. So not only do we have new major versions, but we've got a, a nice little facelift or a little bit of a, a fresh look, um, which I think is really nice, especially because I think we've had the old, old logos for, for quite a while. So we hope you enjoy these when you're sitting down and actually using MB and IDL. But um, back to the matter at hand, and I already kind of rattled off this list. Um, we'll be circling around to this again um, at the end of the webinar. But these are the products that we'll be talking a little bit about today. And it'll be pretty obvious which one we're talking about as we are. So I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly. But um, all right. So jumping on into our content and getting started. So what we're really here to talk about today is our, our family of software products. You know, what I just showed on the last screen and how they really come together to help solve problems for different kinds of users. Now, first and foremost, if you are an IDL user, just because we call it the NV ecosystem doesn't mean IDL is forgotten. IDL is a the foundation and a huge part of almost everything that we do. And we've got a lot of really exciting stuff to talk about with regards to IDL um, here in just a little bit. <clears throat> but back to this slide. So <clears throat> our focus is on collaboration and allowing experts, data scientists to work with analysts or people who aren't necessarily experts at remote sensing or image science. We want to enable them to work together and help that the content that these experts create be accessible by other types of users in an organization. And so what we're going to focus on today, and we call it, I call it the uh, choose your own adventure, is we're going to take a role as each one of these users and talk about how the new releases and updates on the previous slide uh, can be applied and how they change what some of these types of, uh, uh, of people might do in their day-to-day -day job. So with that, we'll talk about the adventure that you'll be picking from. So really kind of the goal is that we wanna show how a lot of the work that uh, has led us to where we are today really is trying to bridge the gap and allow different kinds of users based on your skill level to have access to uh, uh, different kinds of tools. So we have all the way over on the left, what I like to think of as our easier to use or more approachable tools that don't require as much background in remote sensing and image science. And then all the way on the right, we have our tools for experts, for programmers, for those super nerds, which I say in the, the best uh, sense, I am one of them uh, using IDL and the NV API. <clears throat> So choosing your own adventure, this is what we're really gonna be walking through today. And with that, got our intro out of the way and we're gonna jump right in. Remembering back to our three users, we have experts, analysts, and decision makers. What we're starting with here is our experts. So the goal is that we're gonna walk through and talk about some of the new changes that enable experts to use IDL, IDL and MB notebooks, workflows and visual programming to create reusable content that other people can consume in the products over on the right. And this is where we're gonna get a little technical talking about some of our traditional what's new features. The focus for this part is gonna be on workflows, starting with MB. So the way that I like to describe this release for MB is kind of like back to our roots. Um, we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years, you know, trying to develop features that help make day-to-day, um, uh, -day, uh, maybe change detection or other styles of workflows easier to use, but we haven't spent much time applying those same kind of lessons learned for what we like to think of as modern MB user experiences on kind of the core of our product, which is all about spectral science and spectral analysis. With MB 6.0, that's changed. So we have our, our four uh, kind of workflows or tools, depending on what you call them here. We have end member collection, which is a quick and easy tool to map the location of features throughout a scene. We have target detection, which is uh, you could think of as a more advanced flavor of end member collection, which is interactive and lets you set thresholds and play around a little bit more with the algorithms. And then we have material identification, so if you find something in your image working with hyperspectral data, you can compare that 
uh, pixel or feature against the spectral library and try to get an educated guess at what is actually present in your scene. And bringing everything together, we have our spectral hourglass workflow, um, which is if you don't know anything about your data set, you'd like to know what's in it, it's a, a great way to kind of start there and map things out. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna walk through a little bit. We've got two slides on each of these to talk a little bit more about what they are. We're gonna be starting with end member collection. Um, and like I said before, end member collection is a tool that allows you to go through and easily map different features within your scene throughout the entire image. So what this video is actually showing, and it's real time, so I might have to slow down a little bit so I can keep up with the video, is I'm using a spectral profile in MB with a hyperspectral data set from the EMIT sensor on the International Space Station. <clears throat> I'm clicking around and I'm finding unique features within my scene, at least unique to what my eyes can identify. So I'm trying to find things like uh, trees or forests and maybe non-forest vegetation, something that might be meadows or grassy areas. And then I go through to identify a pixel that represents water and bare earth as well. Bare earth meaning it's soil or rock or something else like that. And the uh, as I'm going through this, uh, I'm able to pull those features out of my spectral profile. You can use spectral libraries, you can import from MVROIs or vector files. And one of the really nice things that we've changed here is that all of the things that you identify, you can save to disk and restore back later. So we have this new concept of kind of a spectral collection. And let me pause real quick before the video gets ahead of me. We have this concept of a spectral collection where you can uh, save that out. It's just a simple JSON file, but then if I want to come back to it later and recreate work that I did, I can open that back up. So this is a really nice uh, uh, feature, which you'll see again in the target detection workflow. Um, like I had mentioned, though, this is really that easy kind of try things out. It's a great way to just play around with spectral science and some of the algorithms. Uh, you have, uh, I want to say it's nine to choose from. I might be misremembering that in the dialog that pops up. You can run more than one. Here I just ran spectral angle mapper classification to get a rough land cover classification. Um, I see a question here. The data that I used is EMIT, E-M-I-T. It's a hyperspectral sensor that's on the International Space Station. So this is uh, example number one. Um, the second example we have, which is uh, very similar, is also land cover classification using an emit data set, but I actually used ROIs instead of individual pixels that I handpicked. So the nice thing is that you can use different sources of data here. If you have spectral libraries, you can use that as well. The one thing I will call out is that some algorithms have uh, special data requirements and you won't be able to run every algorithm unless you have the right input data. But things like Spectral Angle Mapper are pretty flexible um, and usually a great place to start with this. Uh, okay, moving on to our second one, keeping track of time here. We have target detection. So like I mentioned, target detection is a slightly more advanced version of end member collection. It's a multi-step process where you can go through you have the same style of dialogue to pick the features that you want to want to map and then you have an interactive process where you pick algorithms and set thresholds um, some of the algorithms that are present as part of target detection do require a little bit of background in spectral science and some experience there to understand uh, how they work uh, one of the things you'll see on the next slide is that if you want a, a quick start here you can use target detection and you can skip any data transforms and just use spectral angle mapper, uh, which is what I've got here on the next slide. So this video here is just showing, let's make sure that this is playing here. There we go. This video is showing me using target detection to do something similar to what I did with m member collection. I'm identifying a couple of core classes. One is vegetation, the other one is water. For vegetation, it's not detecting enough. So I can adjust my threshold to improve the quality of the results. And then water classifies too much. So I can reduce the threshold and fine tune it so it's only picking out bodies of water. 
This is also using emit hyperspectral data, and this is over Denver, Colorado, and uh, uh, you can see Broomfield in there and kind of the right side of the image, which is where we're located. So end member collection, quick and easy, target detection, interactive, allows you to go through, specify thresholds, and play around with things in a little bit more interactive way. Next up, we have material ID. So material ID is more of a tool. There's a little bit of a workflow involved from the process that you go through to use it, but it's very easy to access. Anytime you have a spectral profile open within NB, you have this new button called identify. When you click on identify, it opens up the dialog shown on the right hand side of the screen, which is our material ID interface. Kind of like target detection, material identification is something that can be quite tricky, especially if you're looking at different types of vegetation. So it's important to know what you're doing. And even though this tool is very easy to access, it's good to do a little bit of research to familiarize yourself with some of the concepts to compare what you find in your image versus what you have in a spectral library. So just keep that in mind. Um, but when you use Material ID, you have a short little video here that shows me using same scene as before. I'm clicking around in the image. We have our dialogue on the right updating as I go, which shows uh, different likely matches. And let me, sorry, move some of the webinar things here and pause real quick. Uh, so as this video goes, and it might be a little bit quick, you'll see that this table updates with my clicks. So as I go through, material identification happens really quickly. And every pixel that I click on, it gives me another list of potential matches. Uh, you can also switch the uh, spectral library that you're using as a reference. So uh, I was using just the first one that you have by default, and then I switched to one that has minerals in it. As you are uh, looking at some of the potential matches, kind of like we see here, if you click on the rows in the table, it will add that graphic, or not graphic, it'll add that data as another plot within your spectral profile. So here I have a green line that represents the potential matching feature. And just from a quick glance, I can tell you that's probably not what it says, or not what it really is, um, which is where you need to spend a little bit of time reviewing some of the detections, trying out some of the different algorithms that we have here as well. So each, each column represents a different style of algorithm for material ID. And so it's a really nice interactive tool that you can use um, to help try to track down what's in your scene. But as I said before, very easy to use, but requires a little bit of know-how um, to master and make sure that you've got the right pick. So next, let's move on to our last uh, uh, workflow, which is Spectral Hourglass. So Spectral Hourglass differs from the other three tools that we've talked about in that it helps you identify unique things within your scene. So if I'm looking um, at an image that's over the mountains and it's rocky terrain, it can help me identify pixels that might represent unique minerals or materials that are present in the image. So it's a little bit more of what I like to think of as spectral exploration. It's here's my data set, let me play around with it, see what's present, and try to map that and figure out where that's located in the rest of my image. Just like the other spectral tools we've added, this one requires a little bit of background as well, um, but this has some really fun interactions and visualizations as you're going through. Here, we've got spectral hourglass in action. It's starting a little bit ahead at the n-dimensional visualizer, and I'm probably gonna replay this section a couple of times here because I think it's pretty neat, where um, as part of the spectral hourglass workflow, we go through what's called a data transform to try to reduce the number of bands. And it helps make it easier for some of these algorithms to find what's actually unique within your scene. Once you identify some of those unique pixels after going through a data transform, we have this manual step of being able to look at a 2D representation of the data, which does a whole bunch of random transforms. So you can think of this as we're looking at, you know, six bands, I think is what I have selected here, which gets projected onto a 2D plot. 
And then when we play the animation, it goes through and you can see how some of those pixels move, which gives you an idea of the unique clusters and some of the outliers that represent pixels that stand alone or are different. And that's how you can help uh, uh, visually see some of the uh, unique features that are present. So this is something that has automated tools to find some of those outliers. You can also interactively go through and uh, fine tune the results yourself, and, which uh, it, lots of great ways that you can use that tool. Material identification is also built in to the uh, spectral hourglass workflow. So some of those unique pixels, you can then compare against spectral libraries to try to identify what was actually found within your scene. So all these tools kind of come together to help you uh, with end-to-end -end spectral processing. And what's shown here is this is the second to last step of the spectral hourglass workflow, where I can actually go through and I can map the potential locations or abundance of the, the uh, spectral features that I found before. So here I did what's called a, a spectral unmixing, which gives me a, a 10 band data set, and we can go through and we can just visualize, and this has a little band animation here, and I'll probably pause real quick once I've got this, where this is a grayscale representation of how much of one of the minerals or materials that was found through the n-dimensional visualizer, it lets you know where that is likely in the rest of your scene. So this is a really nice interactive workflow. This one's been around for a very long time in Envy. And if you Google it, you can actually find it referenced in papers as well. So it's, it's needed some uh, much deserved love. And we hope that people will enjoy the new capabilities and features and the fresh look that this workflow has been given. So that wraps up our Envy workflows that we've added. We're going to pivot a little bit to talk about some more workflows, but not related to spectral. So this is a little bit of a sneak preview. This isn't quite ready for release yet, but one of the things that we've always been able to do and had a focus on within MB is working with different modalities and different types of data. So we have, you know, maybe very generally things like panchromatic, multispectral, hyperspectral, SAR, and point cloud data sets. And SAR is one of the modalities that we've spent some time on um, reworking that user experience just like we have with hyperspectral. What's really exciting about these new capabilities that's gonna be coming is that this is gonna have a very familiar uh, uh, drag and drop open display data for SAR data sets, just like we have with optical. No need to necessarily geocode and create a, a visual product. It'll be drag and drop and you're, you can start running. So this is a, in the screenshots we have here. This is showing coherence change detection. Um, and on the right, we have the output from that workflow. Um, you'll see some of the other capabilities that we'll be adding once this is uh, officially released, but that'll probably be Q1 sometime a little bit longer than uh, some of the other uh, upcoming features that we've got. But we still wanted to talk about it a little bit because it's uh, something that's very important to us is making sure that uh, all users have a great experience when they're working with the data that matters for them. So nice segue. We've talked about all of our workflows. And if you've been keeping up with some of our uh, the last couple of releases, workflows have been a constant theme. One of the reasons that workflows are really important is that the steps that you go through get tracked. So for example, here we have coherence change detection. I can manually go through the three steps that we have for CCD. And then at the end, I can click a button that says open workflow and modeler. And I will have an automated version of the steps that I manually went through um, in the actual dialogue itself. Now, not every one of the spectral uh, tools that we, sh we we showed today applies to this. Like for example, Spectral Hourglass has some uh, uh, manual steps that are interactive and require some data visualization. But some of the other tools like target detection um, could be something that you go through and create an automated version of. Uh, but any workflow within Envy that's in the new folder that's called workflows, the last step will have this little piece here. So this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. 
where we have these tools that data scientists can walk through. And at the very end, they can create an automated version of the clicks that they manually, manually went through themselves. And this gets into our uh, a little choose your own adventure where we have um, uh, visual programming, notebooks, the MVN IDL API. So uh, basically you can manually step through tools. You can create MV modeler workflows, which are a great place for you to start playing around with the MV modeler and understand how all the tools come together. And then from your MV modeler workflows, you can convert those directly to IDL code using IDL and the MV API. So if you want to improve the level of expertise that you have and familiarity with our products, that's something that we've had as being really important and integrated as part of the user experience. So you can go through workflows, create an automated MV modeler representation, and then you can convert that MV modeler workflow into IDL code, which you can then use programmatically and further refine yourself and build up your skill sets. So um, this is really kind of the, the, the cornerstone of all the workflows that we've been implementing and adding over the last, I want to say year, year and a half for MV. Um, and it's very exciting to see all this stuff come together. So it's not just being able to click on buttons though. You know, we kind of have a, a segue here on purpose where we go through tools, we generate code at the end, and we have also improved uh, uh, the ways that you can interact with that code that actually gets generated. So as part of IDL 9.0, um, actually just before, we have a new extension, a new developer environment that's called IDL for VS Code. Now this is an extension that's free and open source that you can download and install for Visual Studio Code, which gives you a whole bunch of, of, of nice little features. Syntax highlighting, integrated hover help that uses our documentation, autocomplete, it has um, basic forms of type detection, and it has the ability to detect more than 100 problems with your code and report them back to you. Uh, if you don't like the problems that get reported, you can also turn that off but really trying to get that modern user experience that's similar to other popular languages like JavaScript, TypeScript, um, uh, where it comes to uh, rich tooling and, and really good user experiences, in my opinion. So uh, check it out. It's free, open source, and available. Um, like I had mentioned, uh, this includes, uh, I think, really great user experiences for autocomplete and hover help. On the left, we are able to determine the type of like MV task or IDL task that you're using. We can get the parameters that are used. We get the names. You get descriptions if you hover over them. Um, if you hover over routines, you get the help contents from our documentation, which is also included with the extension itself. So on the right over there, if I hover over the function NV task, it gives me the example and anything else that's included as part of the docs. So all this information that's kind of at your fingertips, where before, if you were a programmer, you'd probably have the online docs open in on your other monitor and you might be programming an IDL in the other one. But this is really kind of a nice way to have everything integrated and accessible all in one location. One of the other things you'll see here as well is we have open examples in Notebook. We have a, a new concept of IDL and MV Notebooks, which we'll talk about here in just a second, which offer a new way to program and play around with our software. Um, notebooks are, I'd like to think of as this really friendly environment that lets you do things kind of ad hoc, uh, just trying out a couple lines of code. You can also use them as, as kind of training to document your thought process and put code snippets and embed outputs in. And this is one of the ways that new programmers and software developers are learning how to program. So this is really important to make sure that we stay up to date with tools and keep up with the latest and greatest. One of the things I wanna call out real quick is that this is not something that uses Python or Jupyter behind the scenes. This is fully a, a part of the IDL for VS Code extension. You don't need to do anything else. It just comes as part of it. So, um, uh, one of the things that I think is really nice about notebooks, and this is a little bit of just kind of a look forward at where we might go with this, 
is that it opens up a, a world of opportunities for different ways that we can visualize and interact with data. Here, I have a double pendulum simulation and I embedded an animation with data generated in IDL that actually shows the pendulum swinging around. Um, so this is something, this is the direction that we're going in. It's not officially public yet and hasn't been documented, but I thought it would be fun to show that notebooks are a great way for us to think about the future and interacting with IDL and MD in different ways. Which brings us to the next slide is that IDL or notebooks are not just for IDL. We have special NV APIs that do require you to have MV installed as well, but you get to have visualizations embedded for raster, vector, raster and vector data sets, and you can create maps as well. One of the things that's a cool little detail of this is that the maps actually use a base map that matches your theme. So if you have a dark theme, like we see here in this screenshot, you have a dark gray base map. And if you have a light theme, you have a light gray base map. So just a cool little detail. Um, here we have a video that shows um, some of the MV notebook examples. Um, this is something that I put together uh, that uh, uh, shows a machine learning workflow where we're identifying a burned area after a wildfire in New Mexico in 2022 using PlanetScope data. So this is just showing a few of the visualizations, how when you're running things like MV tasks, you can embed the progress messages so you can know something's happening if you don't have the MV UI up and running. And then it makes it easy to compare and toggle back and forth if you're doing something like classification cleanup, like you'll see right here. So we've really got a lot of great stuff that's part of IDL for VS Code and some of those tools that we have for uh, workflows, really great things that people can sink their teeth into and take their expertise and understanding to the next level at the pace that they want to go. Um, so one last thing here before we wrap up with Envy and IDL and move on to our next topic is that as part of IDL 9.0, we also have support for IDL on Apple Silicon. So this is just IDL, it's not IDL and MV at this point in time, but we have quite a few IDL users. I wanna say it's about a third that actually use Mac. And all of the new Macs that are coming out only have Apple Silicon um, in them, so you need ARM processor support. So you can use IDL natively on ARM on Mac. Uh, we've got some uh, performance uh, charts here that show how when just using our native ARM build versus the Rosetta Intel emulation performance is much better. So for all of those plots, you want the bars to be higher. Um, and you'll see that for almost everyone with ARM, uh, the green bars are higher. So, okay. With that, we're going to jump on to the next part of Choose Our Adventure. All right. So we were just an expert. Next, we're going to talk about analysts. So if I'm an analyst, really kind of the goal and what we're thinking of from a collaboration perspective within the MB ecosystem is how I can take the content that an expert created, either an automated workflow or it's a data layer. You know, say somebody went through the target detection workflow and got me a really awesome mineral map making sure that I have the ability to consume that and use it, which comes to the products that we have on the right. So making sure that we can take what these experts create and other people can reuse it. So the first thing that we're gonna be talking about here is MB Connect. So MB Connect is a newer product for us where it's a, a web-based application that has basic tools for working with imagery and some new modalities that we'll talk about here in just a minute. But the idea is that this is a lightweight application. You don't need a, a desktop software installed. It's accessible from a browser. Sign in, use it, and process your imagery and mark things up, derive some information, share it with others. And you can open those data products back up in MB Desktop as well. But what we're really wanting to show is that the algorithms that you create in Desktop, which, for example, here I have a machine learning workflow that goes through and does land cover classification on a planet scope data set. I can 
as an expert, I can create a machine learning random forest classifier. Then I can create a MV modeler workflow, which takes the steps together to do our data prep preparation and then classify the image. And I can actually deploy that analytic inside of MV Connect. That's what we're showing right here. Let me pause for just a second. So this is the MV Connect user interface. As I mentioned before, it's a web application. I have the same imagery because we have a catalog. We'll talk more about that here in just a second. And then in this dropdown that you'll see here, this is something that uh, can be configured by the user where they can add new analytics, take the things that they've created on desktop, deploy that there, and have the exact same user experience from a processing perspective. So here I've in already uploaded uh, the data. Uh, so it's the same data set that I'm working with. I just processed it. And then you can wait for everything to finish. I had already processed it so that we can just look at the results right away. And then here we have the same data, the same results, just to show kind of coming full circle. So trying to reinforce that story that the things that experts create can be accessed and used by other people without everyone having to have you know, a, a desktop license, which sometimes can be prohibitive and anything that's accessible via, via the web is always a little bit easier for people to work with. Um, but really, the way that we have these analytics, it's integrated as part of a workflow. So you could look at the results and maybe identify some important feature of interest. You can mark things up, generate a PowerPoint within MB Connect, and then share that with whoever might need uh, the information. But moving on here a little bit, um, one of the things that's also important about MV Connect is that this release expands our data support from a catalog perspective. So behind the scenes on MV Connect, we actually use MV and IDL. That's why we're able to take the workflows that people create and publish them to MV Connect and, and run them from the browser. So here we have RGB, panchromatic, multispectral, hyperspectral video, and some basic support for SAR using the SICKET format. So with video, one of the things that I think is really exciting is kind of like we have the ability to run analytics on imagery, we also have analytics for video integrated as part of a video analysis workflow. So what we have as part of that is when you're working with video data in MB Connect, as that data is ingested, we actually process that those data sets with deep learning. Um, so we go through, we uh, process, uh, uh, frame by frame and we detect features of interest. I'm gonna pause here real quick and call out a few things on this frame where within the user, face, user interface of MV Connect, we have some automated features. So we have car, truck, bus, person, bicycle. And these are all things that come from AI. And when you pause the video feed as it's being played within MV Connect, you can see those bounding boxes throughout the scene of what's detected. Now, not everything in this uh, frame is perfect. AI is not perfect itself. You'll see that there's actually a traffic light that kind of looks like a person. If I didn't call it out, you might have thought out of the corner of your eye that that was a person. At least I did the first time that I saw this. Um, but here, as we let the video play, it's just showing that you can pause and see features at each frame. And then the other thing that's really cool is if you click on one of the features and focus in on trucks, buses, or people, you actually have this neat little timeline view. So not only do we process the video, but we break it out in a histogram representation so that it makes it easy to jump around to different points in the video that might be important. So if you have, say, security cameras in locations where there's not very many people, you can easily find within you know, a 30 minute or an hour long video where people might have walked where they shouldn't have, for example. So it's a great way to perform tipping and queuing. And the last way that you can use AI here, or not AI, but as part of the video workflow is that anything that you find, you can go through and you can add some contextual information, which then gets captured and shown in the sidebar and is very easy for other people to go back through and find and work with themselves. But um, this isn't the only way that we've actually added or changed kind of our, our deep learning workflow uh, with some of the products that we're releasing here. Um, we're going to pivot back to some of our kind of expert tools for a second. Um, 
but at a high level, deep learning is not just something that exists within MB Connect just for video. Uh, if you've kept up with our webinars and content that we've got on our website, we also have a standalone module called MV Deep Learning, um, which has integrated tools that you can use to generate uh, deep learning models for some of the uh, use cases we have or, or things on the right um, without needing to program at all. Um, so uh, one of the things that is new and is a similar concept of tipping and queuing is what we're calling GRID. Now GRID deep learning um, I think is something that's very exciting and has a lot of uh, great ways that it can really be a game changer when it comes to MV and applying deep learning to real world problems. Um, at a very high level, GRID's tip and queue and let you know what portions of an image features are present or not. And this is a fantastic way to help reduce false positives and processing time by only focusing on areas, as shown in the image on the right, that might contain features. On the right, you have an image over an airport that's looking for six different types of aircraft, and that's telling me potential locations at that airport where those aircraft might exist. Depending on how much training data you have or how long you trained a model, you might have a whole bunch of false positives anywhere that's not an airport. So this is a really great way to help just wipe those off the board. Uh, we'll talk about that on the next slide. But one of the things that I think is most exciting about grids is that you get it for free as long as you have other training data for uh, segmentation or object detection model with MB Deep Learning. So to clarify that, the training data that you've already created for object detection or segmentation gets reused with grid. So you don't need to go through and label data special way again, it takes forever. I have spent many, many hours labeling data and playing with deep learning myself. So that's not something that we wanted to have as part of this user workflow and user experience. So if you've already created models with MB Deep Learning, you can create grid models with the exact same data that you have. It's just a matter of training, which takes about probably 20, 30% of the time that it does for segmentation or object detection. But talking about some of the other benefits and things that are great about GRID, is if you do have a model that doesn't have a lot of training data, like our, an aircraft example here, on the left we have a model that really doesn't perform good. You probably shouldn't use this in a real world scenario, but it's great for demonstrating what GRIDs can do. Using GRIDs as tipping and queuing, we can remove 160 false positives to get to the answer that we have on the right. So before, with a model that hasn't been trained very much, and like I said, this probably isn't real world, but you still do have odd little detections like this, especially if it's object detection. And then GRID can help you remove everything else that's you know, not over the airport. Um, so it's a great way to get rid of anything that you might have to go through and clean by hand. So this can save you time if you need to make sure you have high quality results from deep learning. It's a great way to use this tipping and queuing, just like we do with video. The other thing that grids do is they really help you save a lot of processing time depending on the type of model that you're using and how rare your feature is. Back to this same aircraft example, about a year and a half ago, I had to create a segmentation model that was looking for six different kinds of aircraft. Segmentation models are really great. They're my preference actually, but they're very slow when it comes to processing imagery. So the segmentation model that I created took about 13 minutes to process a scene, and I had about 41 worldview scenes that I needed to process, and it took hours to finish. Um, it's about nine, actually. And if you use grids with the segmentation models, we can reduce that processing time from 13 minutes down to about 40 seconds. Um, so that means that instead of waiting nine hours, I just have to wait about 30 minutes to get the same answer, the same information that I had before. This means that, you know, heaven forbid you made a mistake and then you waited nine hours to find out you did it wrong and had to do it again. You know, this is something that you can do multitasking on a meeting or something like that. So uh, grids, I think, are really exciting and it's really uh, probably, well, there's a lot that I like about uh, the releases that we have now, um, but grids are probably one of my favorite. So just a little recap, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but reduce false positives, save processing time, and 
uh, use existing training data, no need to label anything else. Um, one of the things I do want to call out here is that being able to save processing time directly saves you money if you are doing any processing in the cloud. So this is a great reason to use MB Deep Learning, which has an optimized workflow um, uh, for exactly that, because you know uh, every minute you got to pay for up in the cloud, you got to pay for GPUs, and they're very expensive. So um, with that, we've got one more section, and then uh, about three or four more slides, and then we are done. So um, talking about the cloud, that brings us to our last little topic. So our fun choose your own adventure for what type of user you are. Our third little persona was that you're a decision maker. And some of this might apply to analysts as well, where we have those same kind of concepts as before, where we have analytics workflows that experts have created using things like MB and IDL, but maybe I have a lot of data that I need to process or every time a new image is captured, it needs to be processed, or I need to monitor an area of interest. This is where uh, uh, another one of our newer products comes in, which is called NV Inform. So really the goal here is that we can take the content that those experts create and deploy that to process large volumes of data and uh, for persistent monitoring. So here I've just got a couple of examples to help illustrate that. Up in the top right, one of the things that's uh, really cool about MV Inform is that we can do literally global scale processing. Um, what you'll see is not quite global. It's a large portion of the Mediterranean where we're actually running ship detection on SAR data. And you can see some big numbers for like eight and a half million total ships that have been found. Um, but the great thing is that it's all built on uh, cloud processing infrastructure so it can scale to meet demand. The other thing that's uh, important about MV Inform is that it can do processing on a regular basis. As new data becomes available, we can reprocess an area, which lets us do things like persistent scatterers or, or displacement mapping using SAR data for dams, like is shown in the lower left. So not as much a scale problem as every time a new data set comes in, reprocess and let me know if there's there's any you know slippage or movement that I should be concerned about. And lastly, because we are processing data up in the cloud, if you have anything that's time sensitive, we can burst up to process data and get you your answers in you know minutes or an hour or so instead of having to wait days. Um, so anything that might be time sensitive, maybe after disasters or things like that, is a great application for using MB Inform. So with that, you know, really kind of the, the themes and uh, for the content that we showed today, I like to think of as, you know, us really trying to work on making science accessible so that experts can create content and help empower them to collaborate with one another. Take the content that those experts create, reuse that and run it in different locations that you might not have before. And then make sure that we're also providing other tools that aren't just our traditional desktop capabilities with MV and IDL that are web-based and intuitive and you know, not needing you know, specialized training in order to use. The other thing, once we get over to the right, is if I actually go back a slide real quick, these are all GIS dashboards. So the great thing is that we can take MV and form and integrate with existing tools that you might be using like ArcGIS Online, <coughs> excuse me, or other tools like that. Um, so with that, one more slide and then we'll get to uh, q and A. Um, I was mostly on time, about five minutes behind. So all the products that we talked about, IDL 9.0 and MB 6.0, those are available today. If you go to our website and our download por portal, you can find them, run the installers, you're good to go. MV Deep Learning and MV Connect, we have a few things for each that we are wrapping up right now. It's a little bit up in the air if it's gonna be done before the holidays. We only have about uh, two weeks of work before we start getting into PTO and relaxing for the end of the year. So it'll either be just before or just after the new year. Um, IDL for VS Code, also available today. If you Google it, you can get to the Visual Studio uh, Marketplace where you can download for free or you can access directly through Visual Studio Code. 
and MD and IDL notebooks are part of IDL for VS Code, which you can try out today. The only other thing I want to call out there is that with IDL for VS Code, it's open source. You can reach out to us on GitHub to report any problems that you have or start a discussion or just send us an email and we're happy to uh, answer any questions you've got. So with that, we've got uh, about five or so minutes probably to go through uh, Q&A before calling it a day. Absolutely, that was great, Zach. Great looking PowerPoint, love the background. Covered a lot of new features today. At this point, we will address some of the questions that have come in. Some of them have been answered uh, throughout the webinar. Um, and as a reminder, you can submit a question by the question by using the questions box on your dashboard. I do have one here. Uh, Zach, can I use video <laughs> analysis? <laughs> can I use the video analysis workflow within NV Connect and disconnected environments? Excellent question. Absolutely. So MV Connect was built from the ground up to be used in places where you don't have internet access. So you don't, it doesn't connect to or use any of our, our hosted services in like MV Inform. Uh, you can uh, ingest videos all you want, disconnected. It can run on a laptop even um, uh, by itself. All right. So I see a lot of questions that are People are very excited to uh, figure out how to upgrade to NV6.0 in the ecosystem. Uh, Zach, do you have any comments on how to upgrade to NV6.0? Um, excellent question. Uh, for anyone who is using NV already, there's nothing else you'll need to do besides installing the latest version. The only thing I want to make sure to call out, and if I go to my previous slide here, is that if you are someone who uses NV Deep Learning, um, you'll need to wait a couple of weeks before you can install that with MV6.0. Um, the previous version of MV Deep Learning, I want to say it was 2.1, will not work with 6.0. Um, but because it's a major version, uh, you can install, you can keep MV5.7 installed side by side with MV6. So that's about the only gotcha. Um, MV Deep Learning does have a few breaking changes within it uh, because we've made some other dramatic improvements to some of our, our deep learning models apart from just grid. Um, and we're going to have a nice little migration guide for anybody who might have been using our APIs for how they get from their what they have today to the new versions. Fantastic. Um, I guess one more thing, just like we have with our uh, uh, other products, anytime we have a big bump of version, uh, you will get a new license. If I remember right, we have a license migration tool built into the, the license manager, which will attempt to automatically get you a new license. Uh, if that doesn't work, just send an email to tech support or your account manager and they'll get you squared away. I have another softball for you, Zach. Uh, right. This one comes from Brian Bennett. Can you deploy NV Desktop in the cloud, uh, for example, AWS? Yep, absolutely. So if you were just getting like an a AMI, just a, a virtual machine that you're using like remote desktop in, um, you can install NV Desktop on those, put a license there, works no problem. Um, in fact, JP, you, you use that uh, uh, pretty frequently, if I remember right. Um, oh, absolutely. I saw that. Uh, that Hurricane damage tarps uh, down for NV Inform. I, uh, I used AWS quite uh, frequently for that deep learning. Hopefully that answers your question, Brian. I, I did see another question that I might actually be able to take care of, and that is, are we going to see some new and updated tutorials, uh, something related to hyperspectral tools? Absolutely, that is something that my group is actively working on and uh, those will be available on our website. Yeah, JP is the guy to go to if you've got uh, uh, training questions or anything like that. Uh, one of the other things that will be coming at some point is uh, JP and I have chatted a little bit and we're gonna try to get kind of a, a little in-depth tutorial, uh, uh, kind of a, a video, a little informal about how to use some of the new hyperspectral workflows that have been created. So probably be a few weeks, might be after the new year before that comes around, um, but keep an eye out for that too. Um, I see 
I see one question I can answer. Um, does the IDL for VS Code support older IDL versions? Uh, so the extension itself is tested against the latest two versions of IDL. So we test against 8.9 and 9.0. Uh, as long as you have lists, hashes, and ordered hashes, you should be okay, but it's kind of use at your uh, uh, use at your own risk. If you do want to use notebooks, it's only guaranteed to work with the latest version. Might still work with some of the older stuff, but like I said, we just test against the, the last two versions um, of IDL there. Um, yeah, I guess anything else, JP, come into mind? I think we've we've uh, added added some. Oh, people like our our MB shirts. The shirts, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. If we, we can figure out how to get a link to those, then uh, that we can send those out after the webinar if they're if they exist. Yes, actually, that that is an action item. No guarantees on this, but I actually have been asking around, uh, working with our marketing team a little bit to see if we can get kind of a, a merchandise store so that you can get some fun uh, MV and IDL swag. So TBD, no guarantees on that. Um, we'll see if we get there though. And we have a we have a minute uh, to get one more question in, and that is, when was machine learning added to NV, and do you have to pay to use it? But great question. So machine learning, which actually JP, coincidentally, you and I did that webinar about a year ago. Um, I think it was last October or November um, was when we officially released machine learning in Envy. Um, machine learning is completely free. Uh, if you have Envy uh, installed, actually I can pull Envy up here real quick. and show you this. There's a toolbox entry within MV. If you go under machine learning, and I already have machine learning installed, but if you double click on install machine learning, um, it will, uh, if you don't have it installed, it will give you a link for where you can go to download it. Um, it's packaged as part of the deep learning installer, but it is free. So machine learning is free. You don't have to pay for it, but you just download and install the deep learning module, which is available through our website. Um, I guess on that note, real quick, for people that haven't been to our new download portal yet, um, on our company website, up in the top right, you'll have your little person icon. Once you sign in, if you click on my account, you can access the product downloads in the left sidebar here. Um, and so this is where you can find all the previous versions of, of MV and IDL. And here you'll see like we've got MV 6.0 uh, right here. So uh, yeah, just a little another uh, helpful tip. So hopefully everybody knows that, but if you didn't, there you go. That's great. I'm excited to use IDL natively for the M series on, on Macintosh that I happen to be on right now. Nice. Well, it looks like we're coming up on time. Uh, there were some specific questions uh, that came in that we can address offline. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap things up. We appreciate everyone's attention and thank you again, Zach. Just a reminder that a recording of this webinar and the slides will be mailed to you in the next couple of days. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks for attending. We'll see y'all later.